and then you just let it down mm -hmm. and it just slowly it's it got the just, hydraulic system it's hydraulic it slowly, it, the, head, the more weight on it the faster it drops yeah it's right here so like i'll show you watch you'll see it it'll, just, it'll go up well it'll just make it go down and it just lands on there and that makes it <laughs> i nervous. got so scared i got so but scared. i know yeah it's like right there so i know it <laughs> but okay. it was still probably just five feet your away. wife behind you like she oh. was like uh you look like you almost hit that <laughs> but she won't even get in the cars and i didn't know how to drive a stick and on my first day i think i'm getting it in reverse and i press the pedal and <laughs> smash into like a fence oh in yikes and we're at a were body in? shop it was you in, were in a porsche was, and you drove it into a, <laughs> <laughs> let the new guy 20 years oh, old wow. just the way my mind thinks there's I groups did. and there's individuals and there's people that i highly value and it's like yes i i respect and enjoy what i do but i i literally walk through life like this and like yeah. it's every connection that i make might be Absolutely. my role that i have to for yeah. 10 years from the now. The feelings mean So, so uh, dude, thank you so much for being out here yeah. with us. Um, we met, I don't know, how long uh, Two months ago? Three? No, oh, it, was it was cold. Maybe, it was a little longer. It was cold. Yeah, it was maybe a little longer. I think it was longer than that. Yeah. Um, but Matthew, you are a very impressive individual being a multi-brand franchisor, franchisee. Um, and then you also have your podcast and you're also in the broker network. You do a lot of different things. Yes. And so um, it was a really natural fit for you to come on the podcast and talk about yourself and what you do. Would you mind introducing yourself and uh, all the brands that you're with and who are you? Well, I appreciate that. That was a really cool compliment. Um, father, husband, um, serial entrepreneur, I guess. Mm -hmm. So my background is in education specifically in the inner city so when I went to college I went to Wheaton College played football ran track and my degree is in criminal justice criminology criminal justice the goal was to go into these inner cities and be the presence that is is often missing in those areas right like you hear about you hear about a lot of gang violence and you think about the avatar that fits into that violence mm -hmm. and, and who's actually doing it. These are kids and yeah. kids that the, the homes are broken, yes, but the communities are suffering. And so my hypothesis at the time was if I can go in, I can bridge the gap between a lot of these communities and the resources and the opportunities that I've been able to see in my personal mm -hmm. life. And so I graduated from Wheaton in 2013 went to a school in the west side of Chicago, Chicago Hope Academy, worked there for a couple years, lived on the west side in Humble Park. Crazy, crazy oh, experience, yeah. man. Is I that mean, a rough part? I don't, I don't know anything so about Chicago. Humble Park specifically, you're in a Puerto Rican neighborhood, but I lived on an African-American street where the majority of people that lived on this my street were black, but it was in a Puerto Rican neighborhood. So just imagine there were probably two or three rival gangs yeah. that all kind of combined. Yeah in wow. that area one of the last weekends i was there just coincidentally this didn't cause me to leave but there was actually a, a puerto rican festival at the park and a drive-by came through on the street and we had bullets come through our window wow. and i'm literally sitting on the couch with my roommate watching tv and we would hear shots fire off from time to time but we'd also hear firecracker like fireworks yeah. and we'd never like the never game the was the game was being able to determine you know, kids, guys from the suburbs, right, determine what it was. Yeah. And my, my roommate is sitting there, now my brother-in-law, and he's like, oh my gosh, we gotta, oh, dude, it's fireworks, take it easy. The next second, window shatters, we're both on the floor, wow. and it's like, whew, man, I'm leaving two weeks, <laughs> man. I'm glad I'm getting out of here. Wow. But yeah, that was, that's, that's what I did. So I did that in, um, our Chicago Hope Academy is a private school, Christian-based school, um, man, I love what they're doing there. Very special. The Muzikowski family f founded that school, and they're doing amazing things. It's a great day to be an Eagle. Like, those guys are awesome. I moved to Dallas in um, late 2014 and didn't really know what to do. My wife's family had moved down from Minnesota and just kind of set up camp here. My wife was still in school. She transferred to DBU. I took a job in sales, working at a call center, making $200 a day. Loved the team, 
hated the job. I mean, imagine me from what we know, like I'm, I'm moving all over the place and I got to sit and I got to make calls at a desk in, the, oh. in my little cubicle. Just yeah. think about I've, that. Oh, I know it because I've tried to do it myself. I've taken jobs before that yeah. I, I quickly realized I shouldn't I have lasted, taken. <laughs> I lasted seven months and it was That's the typical. discipline in its own right. It was the typical, like, I would have dreams of making phone calls and then wake up to go make phone calls and it was torture. I mean, I was That's depressed. Yeah. So you were what you were making these were sales calls? Sales calls. How I many worked, a day were you having to make? The goal was 200 dials a day. Oh god. And these were that's an auto dialer then. You were now, dealing I'm with I'm sitting auto there. Dialer. I got a list and what it what fan cloth. They actually got bought out by BSN very recently and BSN actually recently just shut them down. But the we were a fundraising company, so we would set up these apparel fundraisers, customized apparel for schools. I'd call the, the head coach of the softball team and say, hey, what, instead of selling cookie dough, let's set up this fundraiser for your school. It's free for you, no cost. You just got to get your kids to go out and sell this apparel. And so it wasn't a hard sell, yeah. right? And me being a coach, I could engage with these guys. I had just actually started getting good at it, but I couldn't do it anymore. So I left there um, thinking, what am I good at now? Well, I got my personal training license. I started tutoring SAT, ACT tutoring. I started working at Prestonwood Christian Academy as a coach. And then I got a job for a guy who did um, sports camps for kids. Okay. So I'm doing all these things, do that for about five months, and then think, let me just wrap this up into my own hustle. I start Hero Athletics, teach, train, build. So I'm going to teach you how to, I'm going to teach your mind with academic tutoring. I'm going to train your body with athletic development and we're going to build a community and we're going to build you as an individual so i offered life coaching as well so those were my three and these platforms. are high school age kids middle school to high school kids okay. and so now i'm going to churches and to schools pitching my program i last about two months and i take it to a school at in south dallas cornerstone christian cornerstone sorry cornerstone crossroads academy okay. down in south dallas connected to cornerstone baptist church Christy Lichtenberg is the executive director there. She heard my, my pitch, said, we don't have a space for that, but we like you. Would you come on full time? Hmm. So this was a very synergistic place from where I was when I was in Chicago, a much smaller, more intimate setting, same demographic of kids. So I came on, I was a life coach. I started a leadership program and we started our work study program. So Cornerstone is a second chance school where the demographic of students, these guys, either got kicked out of high school, they got arrested. I mean, my range of students that were coming back to get their high school diploma, my oldest, now I was 24 at the time, the oldest student that I was a life coach to was, I think, 38. Wow. And he'd been in prison. And I'm 24, and I'm his life coach. Wow. So and he was coming it. back and trying to go he back through school. He was coming back and trying to go through school. Now, Cornerstone has, has modified itself a little bit. They have two platforms now. So they... One is a GED program focused on getting the students in and getting them set up with a trade. Then that's where the work study program that we started back in the day has developed and that's kind of what that's turned into since I left. And then they have the, the classic high school approach that is geared to get the students to college. So the school, I was on the board for Cornerstone after I left. So in 2016, my dad retired from Apple Computer, bought Mosquito Joe, put me in charge. Mm. So I'd been at Cornerstone for a little over a year, year and a half, um, when we started Mosquito Joe. But actually in 2019, they approached me and I came on the board for Cornerstone. So it was a really cool full circle That's really cool. moment. And I just actually left the board this year in February. Super hard decision, but it was the right decision because like you said, I got a lot of stuff going on right now. And for me, I got to figure out how to focus in what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't able to really give what I felt I should be giving. Uh, so, so what I, was your role on the board? I mean, you're, you're really young to have already been on a yeah. board, especially for something like that. Most of, that's a good point. Most of the members of the board, they were uh, members of Watermark Church, yeah. which partnered with the school, especially early on in its founding. They were more financial contributors. Mm -hmm. They were donors that wanted to speak into the direction. Mm -hmm. I was the first ex-employee to be on the board and also because of my background and who I am and my approach I offered a very different perspective yeah. than what most of the board 
um, you know, biracial. I am, my mom's black, my dad's white. I kind of grew up in a ton of diverse environments. And most of the board, I mean, these guys are mainly white, men, older, wealthier. Older, wealthier. There's a much different perspective. There's a bit of a divide between There's what divide. they didn't relate as much. And Christy Lichtenberg, the director, I respect her so much. She was so intentional about seeking diversity in the leadership of the school and in how the whole thing was structured. And so that was her thing. And I just, I love her vision and I got nothing but good things to say about <laughs> awesome. that place. It's got a special place in my heart. But anyway, get start Mosquito Joe in 2016. I got married on March 12th, 2016. My dad flew my wife and I to Virginia Beach for corporate training, franchisee training. That was your honeymoon? On March 13th, 2016. <laughs> we fly out, come back. That's launch commitment the right there. And yeah. Been in it. Been did he, did he go with you or did he just send y'all to learn it? He, so at the time, he was like retired, retired. Like he was living in Austin. He bought the business up here in Dallas. And he had gone to like the Discovery. And he went, I'm pretty sure he went to Academy at a different time than we did. Um, you know, he had to know how to run the business. Right. And it might have been a requirement for him, but the way things matched up, we just went, we went on our own. And you grew up in the Austin area, the Austin I, suburbs. Pflugerville, Pflugerville yeah. Texas, man. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So you know out. how to spell that. that you know I how do. To spell it. Oh, yeah. What letters to start with? P? There we go. Did Let's I get go. it? Let's that go. was Let's I, I, I could have yeah, just as we well been it. wrong on that. We got it. I we only got it. I'm literally thinking, okay, it's been a while since I've driven south on 35, but the only reason I know it is because south on 35. You see that sign, you, you see can't it. miss it, man. You can't miss it. And I only know how to pronounce it because growing up in middle school, I had a friend. Her name was Joy. I don't remember her last name, but her name was Joy. And she was from Pflugerville. Nice. And that's the only, between that and the highway sign is the nice. only thing I know about Pflugerville. Yeah, Pflugerville, man. Special place in my heart. I love Austin. You know, grew up there. I like DFW. It's grown on me. Yeah. For 10 years now. Yeah. So now, I mean, you've lived here longer in your adult life than you did yeah. there, pretty much. Yeah, because, so when I graduated high school, went to Texas State, went there for a year okay. before transferring to Wheaton. My sister graduated from Texas State. Nice. Nice. It was, wasn't it? It was called something different before. Southwest, Southwest Texas, Texas yeah. back in the day. Way man. back, yeah. Way yeah, back that's where my sister day. got her undergrad. All right. Sweet, so man. She still lives in Austin. She's, she's lived in Austin since she was 18. She left Allen. Had to be older sister then. Uh-uh. Little no? sister. That's my little sister. She's okay. three years younger than me. Okay, so what year was she there? Might have been there around oh, the same time. I have time. no idea. Um, hold on, yeah, you're right. Cause she, so I'm 39, she's 36. So she would have been a year to, to a year or two older. She was ahead of me, so she would have been there when I was there. I would have been yeah, a freshman. Probably a, a junior or yeah. senior. Okay. Probably. probably didn't cross paths. Probably. But, yeah. You know, we were there. Her name's Lucy. You'd remember her. All I got to do is <laughs> I tell you her name, you either know her. If you know her, you know her. <laughs> Those years are, are fuzzy, man. Those years are fuzzy. Yeah. But yeah. So you have Mosquito Joes, 2016. Yep. 2016. What was the evolution of that, or what has it been? So 2016, launched Mosquito Joe. It was probably 2018 that we realized we needed to do something. Mosquito Joe is a seasonal business, mm -hmm. right? And this was, sorry, I didn't mean to, multiple territories. I know you've told me this before. We but started, uh, my dad bought the Waco territory first. Okay. Didn't open Waco until 2020. Then he bought Waxahachie, Garland, and Rockwall. Okay. At the time, I lived in Saxe. So we opened up Rockwall, serviced Garland. Mm -hmm. We did a newspaper article in Waxahachie, one of the news, Waxahachie, Waxahachie Daily did something on us. And then we got about 10 customers from that one thing in Waxahachie. Built that out. In 2018, we acquired the Plano Frisco area. So we went from maybe 200 customers overnight to 600. Oh, wow. And we inherited a team. Right, yeah. so I mean, you guys. Cause this was a pre-established. This yeah. was a pre-established business. I had met the owner at uh, our convention, our annual convention, and he was just a good guy. We clicked, yeah. you know, he's a little bit older, so we'd be at the pool after everything, you know, have a drink in hand, and he's showing me memes, and like I'm sitting there laughing at him, like, oh, yeah, it's funny, you know, at, after the 20th one, you get kind of old, but <laughs> I'm indulging him because he's a good dude. Little did I know that a couple months later, he would approach me, and, and this is the thing, like, relationships yeah, and yeah. the power of networking. Like you never know like what's gonna happen when you engage and put yourself out yeah. there with another person. He reaches out, I remember it was my, my sister-in-law's birthday party and I take a call, it's in beginning of February, so maybe a month after the convention, calls and is like, hey man, 
um, we're going to sell this business and there's three other people in the DFW market that we could sell it to, but I really like you mm. and I think you guys would kill it. And I thought, oh man, I don't know how I'm going to fund this thing. <laughs> I don't know. We don't have the money. Well, we'll figure it out. And, and we did. That's and, awesome. And, and, and so that was the Plano territory. Uh, did that, does that stretch in north of 121? You so get, you've got Frisco and Plano, Frisco, a good chunk of Prosper, everything in Allen and McKinney that is west of 75. Okay. McKinney and, and Allen kind of kind of split. So my guy Michael Seitz owns the other half. I was going to say there must the be one side. guy that own, there. There's only yeah there's we one border guy, each other. I was going to say you across. like border each other. So like, like you almost have him locked in. There's like some, boxed in. He kind of has us boxed boxed in. Because we're we're on that west side, so if you look at the Dallas North Tollway and 75, we're within that. You've got all that, and then he's got like he's got above, so the the Prosper Salina, you go up to Anna, Anna Melissa, Melissa, and then back and to East down McKinney out. And He's out. got so he's kind of have this boxed in, boxed in. So the goal is one day he buys me or I buy him. Yeah, it's that makes it's sense. the only it's the so only. So how many territories is he? Is he two or three? He has or is three. That just three. Okay. He's, oh, I'm so jealous. It's set up. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. So see, it feels like based on what you're telling me and what I know about these zip codes, you've got the premium zip codes. We have more premium. Zip you codes, have way though. more premium. We've got some nice density. You have like some of the best zip. In my mind, you have some of the best zip codes in the country. We do. If you look at franchising and how the industry, how mm -hmm. the franchising world works, every time a new brand launches, it's in that area. Yep. It's one of the fastest yep. selling franchise locations. Collin County in the entire country. And then Rockwall County. It's those are the yeah. two best counties in Texas, basically. Yeah. So I got a, I got a nice setup. Yeah, it leads me to ask, there. why did that uh, franchise Z sell? Why was he looking to sell in the first place? He, he, I think there was some personal stuff. I think he was maybe a little burnt out. I think when people get into franchising, they get, and this is, we can talk about this. Franchising, it's kind of like the wild, wild west. And it is an area that needs to be disrupted a little bit, in my opinion. I agree with you completely. Yeah, I that, knew I knew. I you could would. get on a rant, but I want to do that yeah. when I get on your podcast. <laughs> okay, we can. <laughs> we can. And you get a lot of people that get sold a dream and they they live yeah. a nightmare. Yeah. And you get these franchise sales folks that are out there that, I mean, there's the way the commissions are structured. I mean, you can make so much money yep. selling the, the brands. The C-suite consulting to, world of the franchise industry is... It's crazy, man. I and think it's got a lot of good. I love the industry for a lot of reasons, but like you're talking, it's got a lot of yeah. bad. Yeah, and a lot of people get taken advantage of. Yeah. And that was one of the things for me when I looked at, you know, what's the next thing I want to do. I saw that I have a lot of value that I can give and add to the space. And even though he had an amazing area what he thought what the business was going to be was not what he felt that he had and the work that he was having to do in the business wasn't necessarily what he wanted to do and i tell people now when you're looking at a franchise it's not necessarily about the widget but what the widget can do to help you meet your goals and yeah. build the vision and legacy that you want and there was a disconnect there yeah he didn't like the employees that he was having to mm -hmm. employ yeah. when when certain members of the team don't show up where do you have to fall into the business, yeah. right? And a certain widget is you're going to fall in a different space. Well, Mosquito Joe, people don't show up. You're spraying you're for mosquitoes. You're spray technician. Yep. You're no, out you're there exactly going right. door to door carrying our, that backpack. Our third Scoop Soldiers franchisee was um, a gentleman that is to this day still was then and still is my business partner at Executive Lawn Care, one mm -hmm. of our one of our yep. uh, uh, businesses that I did not co-found and don't really have anything to do with. But uh, between my partner and I, we own a majority in it. But he had started that and done awesome, and so he was like, "Well, of course, I'll, I'll buy." And he bought the Plano. Wiley, Saxe down to Rockwall, a single territory, but it had 200 clients even when he bought it. But he, after a year and a half, he hated it for that exact reason. Yeah. Because he wasn't used to having to, the, 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 exec, the model of executive lawn care is very different. You have no W-2 employees. He wasn't used to having W-2 employees and vehicles that you had to maintain and you're constantly turning those, those employees over and when, and, and when those employees quit, he was the guy going out. Oh, he hated it. And so he Man. quickly sold to one of, our, yeah. one of our other franchisees. Which is what I advise people to do when they get caught in that, in that space. And I, I wish, and I, well, let me say it like this. I like it when I see franchisors coming in, acknowledging that there was, it takes two to tango, right? Like acknowledging that there, there needs to be a shift made and instead of pointing fingers, making blame, let's help, let's help exit this guy yeah. and get somebody in that can really take this mm -hmm. thing and, and grow it to what the potential of it is. Yeah. So 
we were able to make that work. Um, it helped get my dad and mom up here into Dallas awesome. from Pflugerville, moved up here in 2018. And for him, he didn't like the retired life. He was getting fidgety. He was getting- Your dad? Rec- yeah. And so now he's more involved in the business. He's able to, he doesn't necessarily need to be for the sake of the business's growth, but we have him in his sweet spot where yeah. he enjoys what he gets to do. There's a couple of tweaks I'll still, I'll still make if, if it was up to me, but we're in a good spot with it now, good. for sure. So what does he focus on? What is his little, little sweet spot? So he does all of our like misting system sales. Okay. He does, uh, he'll engage with the high level, you know, the customers, the big issues. Yeah. He loves people. He so loves he does the big ticket folks. items in a lot of yeah. ways. The, the stuff, so he was an accountant accounts receivable for Apple for 20 years. And so some of the stuff that he hasn't quite let go of yet, Mm -hmm. the bookkeeping things, the tax stuff, you know, the things that, well, I'm not gonna pay somebody else for because I'm really good at this stuff. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, those are things that I would would personally shift. Those are areas that for me, I've experienced that myself, but I've acknowledged that if I want to scale my Mm -hmm. personal life and my business, I need to get the heck up out of this and replace. So those are things that for a while, that was a strain on our relationship because I saw it one way, he saw it another way. But with the way that we've grown and scaled to this point, I've acknowledged that this was his initial investment and it's it's his legacy and I am here to kind of help serve him in that. And so how can I help structure the business in a way that he can kind of come in and have a purpose in it every single day, which kind of led to me looking to do and expand in other areas. And so is Groovy well. Hughes, is that something you did you you've, uh, did separately? So yeah, Groovy Hughes is a completely separate franchise right. with a completely separate parent company that we've done completely separate LLC. He doesn't have any, any technical ownership mm-hmm. over it he on paper. He helps with it, I imagine. But he's, he's involved. So every Monday we, we implement EOS and so every Monday we have our level 10 meeting and we have the entire leadership team. So I've got my Mosquito Joe, I've got my Groovy folks, and we're literally sitting here and we're talking all things State of the Union. And we go through, so he's a part of that. So he speaks into kind of the wise sage, speaks into all Love things it. across the That's board. Awesome. And it's a really fun space. You know, you mentioned in. level 10 meetings. Uh, that has literally been in my inbox, my snoozed inbox every weekend for like the last two and a half years. And I okay. still have not gotten around to like studying exactly how the, the level 10 Game meetings changer. work. I've got to look into that. I You've heard we, me talk know, about I it. Think I've looked into it a little bit and I think we do a lot. We're of doing a lot of it. And I kind of, what little I know about it, we are doing a lot of it, but we have, I've never officially studied it okay. and implemented it. But uh, So I, I picked up the book. So Gino Wickman is the author. I picked up the book. His, the, the OG book is Traction. Traction. And then they've built a whole EOS library. EOS stands for Entrepreneurial Operating System. Okay. And the, the, the system is EOS, and they have this whole library. So I picked up Traction in 2020, and I started looking at the book. Like, this is too dense. <laughs> <laughs> too dense. And fast forward to 2022, I'm listening to some podcasts, and I hear my hero, Eric Van Horn, just mm-hmm. launched his episode today. It's fascinating you mentioned oh, him. Yeah, we, just, we, I was just, just talking to him literally the last two days. I've been talk, so messaging him on message. I am in. LinkedIn. I am in the space I am today because of Eric Van Horn and the Franchise Secrets podcast. And the fact that I today is the one year anniversary of me launching the Streetwise podcast, May twenty fourth, and I just launched my episode with him. Like, Man, that's awesome. I literally was just talking. I he's, was just talking to him a, in the last two days. He and I were going back and forth because he was asking me different questions about my friend, the yeah. Scoop Soldiers. Front and, Street Equity Partners. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 and I, I came across his, uh, I think it's Facebook, actually. It's his social media group on Facebook. The Mastermind? Yes. That one, yeah. yes. And I got yeah. in, I, I, I joined into it in the last couple of, in the last month or so, and he was messaging me, and I've been, I was a little slow to respond, to be honest with you. I felt a little bad, but I'm just bad about the messenger. But yeah, I've literally been messaging with him this yeah. week. That's awesome. That's, small no, that's world. crazy small world. So I'm literally listening to his podcast on a run. He's talking about rocket fuel, which is like the Cliff Notes version. And it talks about the difference between a visionary and an integrator. Integrator is the guy that beats the drum, runs the day to day. Visionary, I think you and I yeah. might relate mm-hmm. on this. A lot of mm-hmm. ideas, can't, can't stay still. Yeah. 20 ideas a day, maybe a minute. <laughs> Half of them are not any good, but one, there's a yeah. gym in there somewhere. I'm a visionary, but I was sitting in the integrator seat. Okay. And my visionary was kicking the legs out from under the integrator. And so I had to figure out how to, how to adapt that. And we've adjusted our business structure immensely since kind of going back through and 
and studying that whole stuff. That's awesome. So. Yeah, much more visionary, and I've got I've got a team of people now, thank goodness, got, to do see, the same. That makes I've sense. I've got Ben, I've yeah. got Jeremy Langlitz, my VP of Business Administration, and he takes care of like the insurance. He's going in for his accounting degree. He's literally getting, he'll have his accounting degree by the end of the year. That's beautiful. Uh, and then Cynthia Hernandez, our Vice President of Operations. And basically, whenever I think in my head of something I don't want to do, uh, I pretty much think of one of those three. <laughs> Which one of them? Is it going to be Ben, Jeremy, or Cynthia? Which one of them is going to do this? Oh, that's beautiful, yeah, yeah, yeah. man. But that's beautiful. Right keep them busy. Right seats. I, yeah, I think I'm actually turning more visionary than... In a lot of ways you are, yeah. So Ben and I just partnered. We're in the process of partnering. Uh, you mentioned the accounting side, your dad doing all of y'all's accounting. So we just adjusted our FDD at Scoop Soldiers and at Chorby. Uh, this year, we're actually going to mandate our franchisees use White Picket Team for their accounting, which is which is the company we're partnering on. The nice. company I started five years yeah. ago, uh, but we're partnering on. And the reason we're doing that is not it's because we've recognized that every single P and L and and balance sheet that is being managed by White Picket already, half of our franchisees already use White Picket. The books are beautiful. They're clean. They're up to date every Friday, technically even every day, because our, our controller right now is literally up every morning at 4 a.m. and he syncs everything. And so the books are basically real time. And then every franchisee that uses some other source, their books aren't bad necessarily, but they're not synced up. They're not the same. They're always different. And you can, ima you can imagine what that does to a franchisor with your item 19. It's, and it's especially tough. Especially yeah. because we're so transparent with our item 19. When you look at Scoop Soldier's item 19, we've pretty much laid out our entire business in the item 19, mainly because I have a big mouth and I want to be able to say what I feel like saying. And so I've got to put it in the FDD. Might as FD, well put it out Got there. to put it yeah. in the FDD. But yeah. we've got to, we, we, we recognize this challenge that the books are, are completely, you know, when you got even just 15 franchisees, let alone 100 or 1,000, every accountant does the books a little differently. Yep. And so yep. that's something we've done recently. It can get super messy if it's not done. So Neighborly has tried to go back in and add systems. And because I think they're a little late, now you're dealing with these franchisees that have been in the game for exactly. 10 years and, and, yeah, and they want nothing well, to and I, do exactly. with it. And I've gotten some pushback even with sure. our little system, we're, you know, still an emerging brand, still constantly in a state of change. We've, and we're just starting, so, uh, but, but uh, starting this new, but yeah, we've gotten even a little bit of pushback on it. Yeah. Um, but it's like, I'm not doing it because I'm like just this shrewd business person that just wants to control everything. Oh no, I'm doing it because the system needs it. The system and a lot of franchisees don't, see what the franchisor no. sees and no. they're not looking at the bigger picture and a lot of them don't care no too they don't and that's that's, kind I, of the that's what that's something i've learned that's too is that a lot of franchisees like when you mention the fdd or when you mention the handbook i mean i'm pretty guilty of this myself but <laughs> they've never actually read it yeah. <laughs> like they don't actually training, know what's in I there i talk to my neighbor franchisee yeah, exactly. we, we yeah. chop it up Couple times a year, I'm good. Let me do my thing. Yeah, that's that's probably the majority of franchises out right. there exactly. across the board. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, how many franchise businesses do you own? So, Mosquito Joe and Groovy Hughes, the two. Okay. So, so far, you're a multi-brand franchisee with those two brands. Right. But what's right. the Christmas lights? So. Hero Home Services started in 2018 because that's what we were talking about. Like, thank you. See, that's why we got to have yeah, exactly it. Why. You're that's awesome. exactly man. why. Yeah, he keeps us on track. We realized it was a seasonal business, right? So I wasn't able to keep my guys in the off season. Yeah. And I didn't like having to start over every yeah. year. So it's what painful. can we do? Christmas lights. And through networking, I was always talking about, oh, yeah, one day I'm going to start a Christmas light business. I said it to the wrong person or the right, the right, <laughs> the right person, or the wrong, depending on the right looking. person. And I get a call one day and it's like, hey, so and so gave me your name and says you do Christmas lights. I didn't have any structure, but it was like, oh, time to go. So I was like, yeah, 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 we do for sure. <laughs> and I took a bunch of like YouTube video notes on how to quote Christmas yeah. lights. Went out there, completely butchered, the, didn't get that bid. But we ended up doing, I think, 10 to 12 Christmas light jobs that year. Next year we did 20. Next year we did 30. And the last couple of years we've done about, we've done about 60-ish, 50, 60 awesome. jobs. You know, the, the year before was, okay, let's make this profitable. And then last year was, how do we do this without me having to get on a single yeah. roof? Yeah. And we did it. 
Yeah. I nice. didn't do a single Christmas so congratulations. light. Congratulations. Which the year before, That's a level. when it was making it profitable, it was, I did every single roof. I'm in the cougar paws. I'm up there. I'm on top. I'm doing all the crazy stuff. My had, wife is, would, is. Yeah, I was going to say. She forbade me yeah. from doing it. So I was like, all right, I got to figure out. I was going to say, that's more source. risky than race car driving, if you ask me. I, I'll, I'll, I'll be I'll honest. And I, and, and I hate to say this, kind of. I kind of hate to say this, but Chor, you know, Chorby's done Christmas lights for, I think, 2017 was our first year. Okay. So you got a couple years. Um, so, and we've got, I think we did around 200 jobs last year. I hate Christmas lights. It makes me so nervous every time around Christmas. I'm like, it, like starting in July, we start talking about safety. Yeah. Like we're talking about safety all the time. But starting yeah. in July, we start talking. Okay, are we training the guys on ladders? Are we doing it? it, it all the what? What are the newest safety measures that we can take? The new tech and the new different, yeah. I say tech. The new gadgets that are that are keep you safe because those roofs just make me nervous. The roofs, man. The ladders, kind of the structure and the angle. Yeah. And you got you know back in the day, it was just me and my dad, and I'm. I'm the one that's got to climb up and he's at the bottom holding the ladder and it's a little shaky and he puts a little rock next to it and he's like, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, no, <laughs> no, man, but, but that's, no. The, that's, I grew up, uh, funny, <laughs> the very first year I had experience with Christmas lights, I was 18, might have even only been 17, but I, it was the first s s Christmas that I graduated high school and okay. I needed to figure out what was I going to do for the winter, the seasonality yeah. of a high school kid mowing 100 yards a week or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do Christmas lights. And so I pay, I remember this, I paid three grand to the guy, or maybe it wasn't three grand. It wasn't three grand. I didn't have that kind of money, but I paid for 3000 door hangers to be put okay. out. So that was more like 300 bucks. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and I paid to have these door hangers put out over here in North Plano. Yeah. And, and I'm doing all the Christmas lights. This is way before LEDs or anything like that. And I didn't know what I was doing. I can just, <laughs> all I can remember, I remember a few, but I remember sitting over the ledge of a, of a, <laughs> of a two-story house. It wasn't like a steep pitch because I, I didn't do a bunch of steep pitched roofs. If I didn't feel comfortable on them, I just didn't do the, didn't bid it. But I just remember feeling like I was near death. <laughs> and then at the end of the year, you know, because you got to go back and take it all down. And I did the math on what I made for my time. And I'd have been better off going and working at Kohl's for Christmas. <sighs> and so heart. From then on, I was I was so anti Christmas lights until the brand of Chorby came about, started okay. to come about, and it was like, well, we kind of got to do everything, whether I want to do it or not. That's yeah. the vision, and we we want to serve the clients yeah. and provide this convenience. And so it was like, all right, we're, Christmas lights is a low hanging fruit. We, it's it's something that we ought to be able to do with 7,000 clients. Yeah. It fits. It fits. And so we started the first year. And of course, it never makes as much money as you think it's going to. It's ne and, and so then it's been questionable. And so for years, we were like, we are making money on this. Like, we are not lowballing anything. We are going to be the most expensive Christmas light installer out there because if we're getting on that roof, we got to make it worth it. Yeah. Amen. And that's still kind of where we've been. Amen. Or, or sit. Yeah. So. Very, very similar. We, we started that. We ended up spending Hero Home Services where we did the Christmas lights. We did the pest control that Mosquito Joe didn't do. Mm. I made friends with a roofing contractor, general contractor guy, and he would have me do attic insulation jobs for okay. him. And so we realized like, oh, okay, we're going to spin this into an all-encompassing home services business. We bought a lawn care company that did uh, weed control and fertilization. The mistake we made was we immediately added the maintenance into oh. it and we were you broke not it. ready. <laughs> yeah. And we literally, we broke it. Yeah. We broke that whole business, like crumbled because we added way too early yeah. and we didn't put in the systems. Yeah. So I was chasing you guys and then we, we actually sold the lawn care side. We kind of divested everything out and we spun the Christmas lights into Lumiere and we could, we'll see how it goes. It's Christmas lights now. If it gets some legs and we get everything else in order, we could do all outdoor lighting. But this is not a franchise. This isn't a not franchise. Not a franchise. Yeah. That's our brand. Business, that's actually. internal. And we're kind of taking it very slowly Cause, at this point. Because the parent company, Groovy Hughes, one of their biggest, most successful brands is a Christmas light brand, isn't it? Blingle. Blingle, yes. Blingle. Yeah, Horsepower has, uh, they've got, they've got Mighty Dog Roofing, Blingle, 
Gatsby Glass, Bumblebee Blinds, Heroes Lawn Care, Groovy Hues, iFoam, and Stand Strong yeah. Fencing. So I was just listening to, on the way back from Atlanta on Monday, I came across in my downloaded YouTube, you know, I download podcasts and then I'll yeah. listen to them, but, but this one was like two years old. Okay. And it was The Founders. Of, Zach uh, 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 Butler, Zach Josh, and Josh. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and I was, I was. It was from 2022, but they were talking about having 25 brands by 2025. 25 by 25. They're not, they're not going to hit that. I don't think. Are well, they? they've pivoted. Okay. And instead of brands, it's verticals. Okay. And so the thing about horsepower is that they've got the internal call center, they've got mm -hmm. the marketing platform, they've got the Z books, so the bookkeeping mm -hmm. stuff. They're, are, so, they're, they're requiring you use their books. Yes. They're, they're, do their accounting? Yes. I would think so, yeah. Yes. And so they have all these internal verticals along with the brands. I think what they found is that that aggressive launch is not super conducive to the health of the franchisee. Right. Right. And, and they're making a lot of changes right now with the FDDs and for new franchisees coming in. I think everybody's gotten kicked in the teeth a little bit. And I think in time, we'll figure it out. Yeah, um, they'll figure it out. They're they know what they're doing. Yeah, they'll figure it out. Those are some smart they're like guys us. They're over ambitious. there. They're super ambitious. But yeah, I'm very interested to see how things kind of change and adapt as yeah. as everybody grows, yeah. you know, moving forward. Okay. Yeah. So, what are some lessons that you've learned as a multi-brand franchisee? Ooh. Man, so I would say if I could go back, timing is everything. Not just in the nature of like the seasonality of the business that you're in. Painting is, is a hard business to launch in the fall because it takes time to ramp up and then you go into a pretty dead season. Um, so think about that. When is the dead season? The winter, Christmas, holidays? It's never dead, but it does slow down when it gets yeah, cold. Yeah. Peaks. Christmas, right. people aren't really spending big money on right. big projects. Yeah. The spring and summer, yeah. it, it floods open. Uh, the other thing, in adding the second brand, you got to be super intentional in making sure that your first brand is like streamlined and ready to go. For me as an owner, Mosquito Joe didn't necessarily need me, but for Groovy to launch successfully, because also I'll say caveat to the third point, you got to make sure you're capitalized well enough. We had minimum the amount of money necessary to launch. I would advise you yeah. to make sure you got minimum plus some. Yeah. And so we were significantly leaning on Mosquito Joe to help support. Like Groovy doesn't pay rent. Uh, my general manager salary is currently being split from Mosquito Joe to Groovy, which is fine. That first year, he was actually still needed to be leader in Mosquito Joe. And the guy that we have that now is killing it as a leader, well, it takes time to develop and yeah. you, if you've never been in a leadership role. And so there were some things that Groovy kind of fumbled a little bit in the beginning because the main guy that I needed alongside me to help me grow this business, his mind was distracted. Yeah. Right. And so that would probably be, no, you're, you're exactly right. Those are, those are some big lessons that I make sure you're well funded. You're paying attention to the seasonality. You, your first business is, can survive without you. And then the last thing I'll say, I thought that just because I was good at home services, I got it. A recurring service like pest control is very different than a sales heavy, yep. big project based paint. These are, these are all very similar lessons that right? I have learned very, in a very similar way as you have learned. Yeah, yeah. and so realizing like, Mosquito Joe, I know how much money we're gonna make this week, right? If we add customers, we'll make more. Exactly. If it rains all week, we'll make a little less, yeah. right? We can't control the weather, but for the most part, I can control with routing and density mm -hmm. and scheduling how much money I can make on a certain month. If I know that if I'm down, why are we down in Allen? Oh, let's look at it. Oh, it's because that one day it rained. Oh, so Memorial Day's coming. Let's move some stuff up to catch up. Yeah. Now we're not down in Allen anymore, yeah. right? Like you can control that. You have so much flexibility in that, but yeah. when you're starting over every single month or every single week making the sales, right? You're, you're, it's a you whole different be, game. No, that's, you gotta be and that's something there. I've experienced uh, at Chorby. That's the challenges. You're, everything you're speaking about is literally like the definition of the problem with Chorby. <laughs> <laughs> Focus. Yeah. Yeah. Focus. How, how do you stay focused when you're offering 35 different services and mm. still planning to add more? <laughs> mm. Man, I read, uh, so Private First, Michael McCallowitz, he's talking about his, his landscaper guy. 
that this reaches is prof, out. You said profit first. Profit first. Yeah, okay. He wrote toilet paper. Yeah, I know profit first. Though. Yeah, pumpkin plan. He's fixed this next. Like a couple. That's the thing about me, man. I I didn't study this stuff in school, and I got thrown into it fairly young enough, not as young as you, you started, you know, mowing those lawns when you're, you know, Yeah, but 12. I didn't go to any, I didn't have any education, yeah. so you've had way more formal education. Sure. So I, I couldn't I've, finish a class. I've learned how to be a student, and I'm a student yeah. to the game, so I'm always listening, I'm always reading, and he's talking about his landscaper that was like, oh, you need that? Oh, I can do that. Oh, I can, you exactly. need to get up on your roof, yep. your gutters, I can do that. And he talks about the, the difficulties in that sort of a mindset, yeah. and I, I had a hard time with it, because Again, we were building yeah. what you guys have. I mean, you guys got a huge head start on us there, but yeah, and we've probably now less like, so than you think we do. But. We've we've taken a step. <laughs> Why? Well, you know, you got some money. <laughs> that's all. That's all from poop scooping. Yeah. Okay. Chorby don't make me no money. Okay. 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 <laughs> Fair enough. Fair Ch- enough. Chorby is a monster in that sense. Exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. Chor- Chorby. As soon as it became Chorby, it stopped making money mm. because we're trying to go into so many services and like you just said you know what i can relate to on the paint on your groovy hues you know we my background is lawn mowing yeah there's a seasonality to it but like you say you grow it you want you know you get a client you're going to keep that client for three four years yeah by and large yeah and it's recurring and then we went in and we really wanted to build a tree trimming business. Actually, inspiration from Monster Tree Service, Josh. Yeah, there we and, go. And, and so it's like, we want to build this tree. Well, it's a whole different game, like you're talking about with, with Groovy Hughes. You have to resell. You have to, first off, have branding and have, have the credibility to be trimming trees. And it's a whole nother ball game. Yeah. And at Chorby, I'm using one of numerous examples. There, it was like that for tree and, tree and shrub. It was like that for plumbing, which we went into last year, which cost 10 times more than I thought it would. <laughs> Literally, I'm not exaggerating that. I, I, I thought it would cost X and it ended up costing 10 times X. Uh, and, and, and so, and plumbing is similar. Like right now our strategy for plumbing is, you know, break even on the commercial side and then we can focus on building more of that recurring. Sure. But Handyworks, Handyman Services, that yeah. was one that, frankly, in a lot of ways, it just bombed. Like, like we spun our wheels to the point that now we don't even actually technically service or do Handyman wow. Services. Because, again, we were trying to do so much. We're spread so thin to do what we need to do at Chorby. You know, Chorby's a $7 million business. I'm sorry I'm taking time here, but it's Chorby's a $7 million business. In reality, we've got to spend $7 million a year, <laughs> which we don't have just to market the services we have to actually build the brand. And it's because we don't have that, it's just this constant grind. Man. Yeah. Now, I luckily, I have an awesome team. Yeah. And that's one thing that I, the, the benefit and the beauty in Chorby is that I've got this incredible team. We have extremely low turnover, like ridiculously low for the services that we offer. Which is huge. Huge, in awesome buy-in. We have yeah. an incredible leadership structure, starting with our vice president of operations, all the way in our director of agronomy and our manager of, of fertilization, weed control, and so on and so forth. We've just got this awesome leadership team. So it literally runs itself. But yeah, it's a grind for, for them. And even as an entrepreneur, it's like you want it to happen so much faster than it's going to happen. Yeah. Oh, I feel that, man. I can uh, relate so much to it. That's, that's <laughs> kind of why, why I went into the, instead of trying to wrap everything into one, what if I can build yeah. an, an operations team and then look into these franchises with some already established yep. structure yep. and then just add them into the team that I have. So I, I have a team of leaders that can operate any specific brand. Exactly. And that's the vision that we've been working on now on that part of it. We just gotta, we just gotta figure out <laughs> this groovy thing. Yeah, and we're getting there. You're, yeah, I wanted to, to bring that up because uh, you mentioned like you have, you have a leadership meeting that happens every, every, you know, every recurring, Monday. Yeah, every Monday. Who is on that team? So it's, it's me, my, my dad, whose main focus is, think about him as general manager of Mosquito Joe. I have my sales and marketing leader, and then my general manager for Groovy Hughes, and then I have my field supervisor for Mosquito Joe. And so the field supervisor, he's the one that mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. kind of came up underneath my now general manager yeah. okay. and was lead tech, been my lead tech for a couple of years, showed so much promise, would always ask the right questions. Mm-hmm. And 
I'm a big, like, you do the podcast, you learn how to ask questions. You yeah. can always tell the caliber of somebody based on the yeah, questions that they sure. ask, especially you get somebody and you're looking at a leadership position because mm-hmm. you can see where their mind is at. And so for him, it was like, yes. Mm-hmm. It took him a while to figure it out, but he's in a good spot now. He's doing good for us. So it's, it's that group that meets every. So we got the technicians and we got the crews that we will engage for 30 minutes right before and then send them out. Like, y'all got to go because we're about to talk about you. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, we do yeah, it. We hold it down. Awesome. Yeah. That's an important aspect because, you know, um, if you look at the individuals that might be watching this who might be interested in, in owning multiple franchise sure. opportunities, that team that's going to help you run it because you can't do everything yourself. Like, that's an insanely important what you alluded to as, as well. What are those key elements of what you need to have in your leadership team Come to be on, able man. to actually operate and scale it? Dude, I love that question. Thank you. So the first thing I tell people, you got to know yourself, right? You got to know your strengths. You got to know your weaknesses. I could, the way you nerd out about these cars, I can nerd out about personality assessments oh, nice. for hours. And I really think it's important for people to dive in and really study yourself because if I know my strengths and I know where I want to be, I know the role that I can fit into this business, especially during the launch. Anything that I am not good at and I hate, outsource that immediately. Yeah. And then and then go from there, right? Like as you as you reach scale, you can outsource more things. But yeah. I think early on it's important to really identify who you are and who you're not, and then build a business that you don't want people that are just like you, but you also want people that can buy into your culture and that can fit into the, the puzzle piece like we talked about earlier. I think that's really important. So you just like, hit on the next thing I was gonna talk about, buy-in. How do you get people to buy into it? You gotta buy into it first. Like you gotta have, I'm big, EOS has taught me to have my core values on paper me I have them on I'm a whiteboard guy like you go into my spot there's whiteboards everywhere and I got my core values on the wall that you can't come in without seeing the core values and if I know it I pitch it I preach it and they don't have to like they don't have to truly understand why they exist but they got to know that they're being graded on those things Mm -hmm. another EOS concept is the people analyzer and when you have your, your core values, anywhere from three to seven, right? Yep. You, you set up a scale, and you're like, all right, how you grade each individual person, you either give them a plus, they exude this with excellence. You give them a plus minus, eh, they're okay. A minus is they don't have it. With your leadership, you establish, all right, what are we willing to accept here? If I've got five, I need three pluses and two plus minuses. If anybody has a minus, they really can't be on the team. Like there's a permission to play bar. Patrick Lencioni, he talks about permission to play bar. And it's like, if you can establish the permission to play, you can build on that later. Like mine, my core values. First one, ideal team player. It's a Patrick Lencioni concept. Humble, hungry, smart, smart being emotionally intelligent. What book is that? So ideal team player is, is, a the, book, name of the, book. is the name of the book. What is the book that I've read of his? It wasn't He's that got one. five He's dysfunctions got, of a team. That one. That's, that's, one. that's yeah. another yeah. top that one, one that I, I that I got. So yeah. I knew the I knew the author's name. You were I couldn't yeah. think of the book that I had read of his. Ideal team player is my number one core value. You gotta be humble, hungry and smart to be on to be on the squad. Two is you gotta give best effort. Like you might not be good at a task, but if you're a student, you're willing to learn and try your hardest. I'll, I'll work with yeah. you. The next one is value adder, problem solver. You got to seek to add value. Don't come to me with all your stuff. Like yeah. if you're just bringing me problems, I really don't need you. Like you yeah. got to at least yeah. try. Hey, here's a problem. And I think we could do this and this. And then I can help you assess which direction right. we can go. The next one is uh, best. I already said best effort. The next one is service, service, service. Service your team service yourself, and service your community. Yeah. And if you can do those things, we can really build something special. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Did I say five in this one? I said four. I don't know, but they were I good. I do team player, best effort, value adder, problem solver, 
and then service, service, service. See, this is why I always stick to three because I tend to forget anything yeah, beyond three. Yeah, it's ADHD, man. It's <laughs> ADHD. It's, it and that's why I, I literally, on my podcast, I just interviewed an ADHD coach and she talked about the whole working memory thing. Mm. And she told me a, a skill that you can like use is like writing stuff down and having the notifications. That's why when I walk into the shop, everything is right there in front yeah. of me. Yeah. Because my working memory is not the best. No, I need to. I know exactly <laughs> what you mean. What are our, we just actually established three core values Sir, specifically you, you for Chorby. Oft. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see try my best, but I'm going to need your help. It's oft, O-F-T. Now I'm, I'm quizzing myself because it's literally been about three weeks since I've put some thought into this. And this is a perfect example of how I'm bad at remembering it. Let me think here. Ownership mindset. There you go. Future minded. Future focused. Future focused. Thank you. And transparent. Trans, uh, transparency in all things. Transparency Love in all things. I knew it was transparency. Yeah, those are those are the Chorby core values. That Love we, it. Uh, but we do, and we do, including me. We've got to. I've, I've got to get better at talking about it on yeah. a weekly basis. Because that's Chief the repetitive only way. officer, man. That's what you know. The leader. Yeah. You he's got to repeat this stuff over and over. And oh, over I think they'd all around. agree. I'm pretty good at that. Yeah. <laughs> I feel repeating that. myself. I feel that. But. Uh, and I know something that speaks to what you're saying that uh, Cynthia Hernandez, our VP of operations that I've mentioned a few times, she routinely uses the term um, attitude and intent. Yeah. It's about attitude mm, and intent. That's good. And that's very much so kind of speaking to what you're talking yeah. about is to, does the team member have the right attitude and intent? Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, you, you clearly operate that that's way. That's good, man. Yeah, and the thing, I just know people that they're not going to stay with me forever. Right. right, like you yeah. got guys that are, you know, they're doing landscaping, they're spraying for mosquitoes. Like they come to you in a very specific time in their life exactly. that it might not last. And so when I realized that, I was like, all right, how do I create a system that will help you be better than you were when you came in? However long the exactly. time horizon is, how can you leave better than when you came? Exactly. And, and, and that's really cool that we've seen that. We operate very similarly. Uh, one of the things we've done the last two years that Ben's been diligent in and being helping us be consistent in is doing a, um, a quarterly book book review. Oh, I love that. For that idea. same reason is because we recognize we go to our team members. And so anybody that's a, in any leadership role, yeah. uh, they are required. It's mandated that they're, it's just once a quarter, it's a 30 minute review. It's basically we all get on and talk about the book we read and we have 12 weeks to read it. So it's really not too, too difficult. But we mandate it for anybody that's in any amount, any kind of leadership position, and we push and very much so encourage anybody that's a technician or anything. But to be on here, and we tell them, look, this is you've got a university in your truck, it, it, you've got Bluetooth, and you can you, you've you've got all Preach. of this content, go. YouTube, all the different everything. You, YouTube in itself is better than Harvard, frankly, and so use that, and we want to help you with that at least do one book a quarter yeah. with us because you're hopefully you're not uh, many of you won't be here forever some of you will because we all also encourage entrepreneurship and encourage that if you want if you want to be a future business owner talk to us we can help coach you in that but we also know that some, a lot of people are going to move on to, yeah. to, to new and better things and new passions and we want them to be better when they leave oh amen man love it i love it talk to us about where can people find you uh where can people find you and follow you so yeah, the Streetwise podcast on all platforms, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, check me out. That whole thing is based on helping people get off a of zero and becoming the person that their dreams need them to be. And it just so happens to be through my lens as a franchise owner and a franchise consultant. I'm on all, I mean, Matthew McReynolds, you can find me on Facebook. LinkedIn is my biggest platform. Instagram, I'm trying to do the whole TikTok thing, but... I'm getting I know what you mean. I know what you hit mean. Hit me hit me up on any any platform, follow the podcast. 